I'm Eric Neunschwander, and I'm head of user privacy at Apple. Okay, so I've seen your presentations at WWDC, and I think they're kind of famous because Craig always drives a sports car in, or he uses his portal watch, which is still not released to the public, as far as I know, or he just superhero three-point stance drops down into what I assume is the Apple Park Batcave, uh, where you do all those things. We don't think you should have to make a trade-off between great features and privacy. Does having that, you know, from the top down mandate. We at Apple believe that privacy is a fundamental human right. Uh, and going all the way back to Steve Jobs, you know, he said. Privacy means people know what they're signing up for in plain English and repeatedly. Ask them, ask them every time. Make them tell you to stop asking them if they get tired of your asking them. So does having that foundation, does having that legacy, does that make your job easier? Does it add a lot of pressure or yes? I, probably the answer is yes. I mean, it's greatly inspiring to me and to the team to know that we have that support at high levels. It also means that uh, there's no free pass on us. A very high level of privacy is expected of us. I think that's great from our perspective, but uh, it does do that other side. It certainly is both uh, reassuring and also a real spur to action for us. I just. I don't know if everyone appreciates just how complex, how nuanced a lot of this stuff is. I mean, you have, we have some governments beating the privacy drum while also trying to outlaw encryption. We have data repatriation. It's, it's a thing now in some countries that maybe we don't trust, but that also maybe don't trust us or our servers. We have people who want their data secured against theft, who worry about that a lot, and others who want it safe from loss. They don't want to be locked out of it. Then you have users who want private relays and carriers that want packet shaping and snooping, frankly. You have protecting health data while making it accessible to caregivers and to providers. You have two-factor authentication that needs to lock out everyone but the end user. Then you have platform versus app, first versus third party. Is your assistant too intrusive or is it not getting the data it needs to be truly helpful? And most recently, we've had child advocacy advocates squaring off against zero, zero knowledge proponents. And I imagine that that's just on a good day. So my first question is, how do you even begin to balance all of the wildly, wildly different and sometimes completely conflicting agendas, opinions, and requirements for everything that you do? Right. I mean, it is one of the things that makes this job amazing, I think, is just how relevant it is to people around the world and how they want to conduct their lives and be free and use our products. It's something that they deal with every day, and I think privacy is a huge part of that. And for us, it really comes out of putting the customer first in our mind. That's not something specific to privacy in the slightest. It's really part of what Apple is. And so in that respect, when we think about our customers, we think about privacy being a fundamental human right and how the only way that you're going to realize that is by designing it into everything that we build. And so we really step back as we look across the products that we create and think about how to do that in the way that the product's going to be used by the customer. We want great features and great privacy. And I think we've shown time and time again across the years that we can deliver on that, that we can work hard and we can deliver on that. So that can be things like having end-to-end -end encryption in iMessages. It can be things like providing great insight into applications and their data use and how they might be tracking you. We've brought other things out like privacy reports in the App Store and the nutrition labels. So that sort of transparency and availability to users and having some core default privacy in the products has been key. And we look at that not in a product-specific way, in kind of four major areas or pillars that we call them. So the first of those is data minimization that we think about how to stop collecting the data in the first place and only collect what's necessary to provide that product or service. And we really put that at the foremost of the design of a feature that we look at, because if you just avoid the data collection up front, then that is a great way to be privacy respecting to the user by leaving them in control of their data. And so a way that we do this is through on-device intelligence. And we've actually, over the years, even improved our hardware and made changes to the hardware of our devices that allows us to do more of that processing to give users great experiences on their device by processing the data on their device. You know, One of the great things that we did recently was to move Siri to where the audio by default stays on the user's device. And it's actually able to do the speech recognition on the device rather than sending the raw audio up to, up to Apple. A third pillar that we use is transparency and control. 
So where we are collecting data, we want to be transparent about it. We want users to understand that. We want them to be in control. But that kind of comes third in the list after we've looked at how are we minimizing the data and exploiting the power of the device completely so that the user, again, keeps in control of their data. And then last but certainly not least is security, which is foundational to providing not just the three things I already talked about, but also confidentiality of data while it's in transit and while it's stored. So we think there in that light about encryption and specifically end-to-end -end encryption, which in our case means that Apple doesn't possess that special key that can be used to read the data, that instead that key is remaining under the user's control and the data, whether it's through iMessage or through our notifications to be able to have that be available to the user without exposing that data to Apple. If a business is built on misleading users, on data exploitation, on choices that are no choices at all, then it does not deserve our praise. It deserves reform. Nobody talked about security until Windows XP and the whole viruses thing exploded. And no one really talked about privacy until you started mentioning it on stage or maybe you know some of the big Cambridge Analytica incidents. As much as the discussion itself is important, I think making those big claims it then holds you to account to fulfill, to live up to those big claims. Absolutely, and I think the accountability is important. Really, it's about the user's experience and what they can do with their device. Now, unfortunately, a lot of implementations of many things people do online come with a, a side order of tracking maybe that wasn't asked for, and this is starting to become uh, more realized by people. That's good in the sense of that sensitivity will hopefully help them make choices that they uh, will be happy with. But also, I think it distracts from the great things that technology can do. And so I personally would be happy if the uh, great technological innovations that I'm sure are still to come came forward without having to require that people be so concerned about their risk, the risks of, uh, to their privacy with those features. There are some places that you can just tell that there's a new feature, they're super excited, they just wanna get it out the door, and maybe they give it a shellacking of privacy before it gets kicked out. But your team, my understanding is that you're, you're involved from the very beginning, from the whole concept phase through. Uh, is that, can you explain a little bit about that philosophy, that privacy by design approach? Yeah, it's critical that we are involved early because it is, you know, you said, uh, I think a layer of shellac, like it is hard to put on the outside of something which maybe doesn't have, say, data minimization at its core, uh, it, it takes a lot of work to build that in. And if you don't consider that from the outset, it's going to be prohibitive to do so later on. And so it's very important that uh, we're engaged both to help with issue spotting and to talk about really where we see the risks of, of the data or where we see um, increased sensitivity around attacks that can be mounted on top of data. But at the same time, it is a, it's a partnership with the teams because they're the ones coming with where they want their domain expertise to take their feature in the future. And that's great. It leads to much improved and richer functionality for users. And what we bring along with them is looking at how we can take the increasing use of privacy preserving technologies and the increasing power of our devices to bring that functionality forward with a very light touch on the user's data. Some of my favorite features, I think most recently privacy labels and the new privacy reports, because I download an app that lets me see what my face would look like as a chihuahua, and it keeps putting up all these modals for me to consent to, and I just want to see my face as a chihuahua. So I'm just, I'm just, I have complete dialogue fatigue. I'm just pushing my way through those as fast as possible, and I might not even remember what they are next, but this way I have an idea before I download it, and I can go back and review it afterwards if I have any questions. What that allows users to do is to get access to information, and in particular for the case of the app privacy labels, to have an easy, uniform, glanceable way to understand the data collection practices of the developer behind that application. And they can do that before they've downloaded the application. They can do that before there's actually a pressing question. You know, one of the challenges that we see, uh, and it's not unique to us, is that when you try to put a question in front of a user while they're trying to accomplish some goal, that's not always the best time to intervene to that user. You've actually seen us do things on the platform to try to remove prompts while preserving privacy for users by making the data that they're providing be part of the action that they're doing so that they still keep that transparency, they're implicitly consenting by doing the action, understanding what data is being made available. With the app privacy labels, we're trying to get out of that moment where the user is making a, a very possibly time pressured decision. And instead they're browsing, yeah. they're looking at a bunch of information about the app, including screenshots and in-app purchases and other details. 
and they can look at the privacy information. And they can do so in a way where once they familiarize themselves with the label of one application, what they've learned carries across all the applications they're going to look at on the App Store because we have a method that the developer fills out and reports on what their collection purposes are that we then present in a uniform way so that the user is seeing the same kind of schematic information each and each time. And so I think that that's been really, really helpful on the label side. On the app privacy report, that then comes along and thinks more about the usage of the application as the user is using it. Because you might be using some part of the functionality of an app, but not other parts of the functionality of the app. And so that shows you really now, what is the application doing based on your actions? And this is something that, again, you can review at your leisure. You go into settings, you can turn on the app privacy report. And then as you use the applications, that data will flow into the report. And it shows things like the app's network activity in terms of the websites or other endpoints that it contacts. And it also shows the data and sensor access. You, you first had to grant permission to that application to even be able to use that sensor. But then once you've granted that permission, you can now start to see, well, what's the pattern of use of that data or of that sensor that I gave the application permission to? And does it align with what I expect based on how I've been using that application? Hide my email. I thought that was something that was going to fly under the radar because just messaging seems like it's everything these days. But several people in my extended family talk about how much they like it. And we saw the idea of, of like pseudo random emails with login with Apple previously. Did hide my email sort of spin out of that? Or has email as a general focus area been something you've been interested in for a while? We've been interested in email for, for quite a long time. Um, the, the security of email, the um, ability for users to manage the email on their device very well. And with Hide My Email, I mean, you're quite right. We understand that a lot of brands, a lot of uh, companies really still do find engagement with email with their users. And so that's great. However, they can reach their users and accomplish um, a good relationship with them is, is great for our device to support. But the other thing that an email address is or has been is a standard identifier. It's really annoying to change your email address to move. And so yeah. it becomes this identifier for you that can get attached to a profile of you. And that profile then can be shared and monetized across a bunch of unrelated entities. So with Hide My Email, what we wanted to do was take a feature which is actually already part of Sign In with Apple. Sign In with Apple addresses the ability to sign into a provider without having to manage yet another password that can be breached and stolen and then cause you harm. It sits on top of the strong two-factor authentication we have for your Apple ID. It makes it very easy for uh, providers. But there are many other cases where you don't even set up a full account with them. You don't even need to be signing in, and yet you're just providing an email address for order updates, for some sort of status of something that you're doing with the service. And so Hide My Email gives you the ability, even in those cases, to now select a random address that is unique to just where you're using it, say that site, which then doesn't correlate with your behavior on other unrelated sites because you can provide each of them an email address. Now, the nice part is, is that that automatically forwards to the one email address that you have. This is a transparent mapping so that from your perspective, you've just provided the same thing as if you provided them your personal email address because it still shows up right in the inbox that you already know, that you're already going through. And it tells you that this is using your Hide My Email address, but it still arrived exactly where you expected to see it. And then for users who want to, you can go into settings, iCloud settings, and continue to manage these. You can create new ones all on your own. You can delete ones if you don't have a relationship in, with that uh, vendor anymore and you don't want to keep receiving emails. You can add notes to yourself about where you used it so that you can help remember which address is used where. So it puts you in control of those mappings and gives you the same sort of ability to get that message from the vendors that you want to have a relationship with without providing them that thing that turns into a profile that you have no control over. Yeah, I, I use it for for uh, distant relatives too, but we don't have to we don't have to talk about that part. It's it's about you being in control, Renee. It's about you being in control. Yes, absolutely. If the twenty twenties have taught me anything. It's about me being in control of my own destiny. That's what fascinates me so much about this stuff, though, because I think a lot of people look at email like it's this old fashioned commodity protocol that was never built with security or privacy in mind, and maybe would just try to shove people into a more modern messaging, you know, paradigm. But so many people still use it for so many things because it is that deep early internet infrastructure. And I love how you're looking at it and trying to find ways to still fit privacy and security into it, like mail privacy protection, for example. Could you just explain some of the architecture about how all that works? Yeah, absolutely. So 
Uh, mail privacy protection, if, if you roll back, for people that have been using email for a long time, let's say that you have, you might remember that it just used to be text. It just used to be words. And then along the way, email became really rich. It includes images. So that makes the emails a lot more engaging and, and easier to read, maybe. But what it also did is it allowed for these inclusions of invisible pixels. And I mean invisible in the sense of you don't see them. You pull up an email, you will not see this pixel that is part of the email. But it basically beacons out when you're opening that message. And so that includes the time that you're opening it. It implicitly includes the fact that you did open that mail. And because of the way the internet works, it includes that IP address, the location of your computer on the internet, which people can use to associate behavior across unrelated entities, across time, and even figure out where you are on the planet, your location, even without using location directly. A lot of people have invested to try to make IP address uh, code for this. And so the act of opening an email then sends this message out that this person at this time on this spot on the globe read this mail. And people didn't know that this was happening. Now, we want to provide the transparent experience of opening an email and seeing it work exactly as you expect without that additional tracking that was coming along. Uh, we've had a feature for a number of years where you can actually turn off the image loading, say, in your mail messages, which helps suppress some of this. But it also means that often you're looking at an email that wasn't the way that the sender intended. It might be harder to navigate. It may not even include content because it was all embedded in the image. So this is a case where you weren't getting that great feature with great privacy that I said we always seek to do. So mail privacy protection now gives you both. When you open up the message, what will have happened under the hood is your computer will have likely already fetched the resources, these images that were part of the message. So the fetch of these images then is disassociated from the act of opening the message. So it's fetched regardless of whether or not you open it, so they're not getting that signal about you. It's fetched at a time that is basically random, so it isn't correlated with when you actually performed this, and if you're reopening the mail, it's not going to fetch it. And the way that we fetch it uses IP address protection, so that the actual IP address, which ultimately is getting this image and downloading it, is not your IP address. And all this is done in a way that Apple isn't learning about this content, but we're still able to deliver in your mail client a properly formatted message. It has all the images, but without now that signal going out that says you, at this time, open this mail from this location. And a really fascinating thing to me, like I used to work in, in marketing and I used to run like Marketo instances. And one of the reasons I don't is just how gleeful people were about pixeling everybody and selling pixels to other parties and doing all of these things. Because I think from an industry perspective, they truly believe they own the data. Like you're using their thing, you're receiving their thing, it's their data. But it, it feels like we almost have like a, a take back the data movement going on where the data doesn't belong to the place where you're going or the thing that you're looking in, but it belongs to you. Your activity is your activity. And I don't know if this is like a pendulum swing or a rebalancing act, but it does feel like at least you're giving us the tools where we have, we can at least start playing the game. Like we have one foot in the door now. Well, or as users want to engage, I mean, think about the next step. So you open a message, but then you actually are interested in what's being described. And so now you engage with that offer, you click something to get more information. At this point now, you're establishing that relationship with whoever this provider is. Like, oh, that t-shirt's on sale? I, I, I think I might buy it. And you actually go to the site to think about and look at the shirt, see if they have it in your size, whatever. At that point, when you're engaging with a specific party and thinking about transacting with them, you're actually on board with that relationship with that vendor. What we think is something that users should be able to avoid is that kind of pernicious back-end data sloshing back and forth, the whole data industrial complex building up a profile about you yeah. that you didn't even know existed and is getting shared and reshared and broadened out in a way that you can't control. Versus you received an email, you might want to look at it. And if you look at it, you might want to click on it. And that's actually something that now you're participating in. And that's the kind of activity that users are in control of. And that's the kind of activity which can still work now, but without that hidden tracking that was going along before. Eric, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. And I really appreciate the effort that you and your entire team put into this every day. And thank you, Renee. I really appreciate your interest and the great questions and just that people will get more educated about privacy and how it's working.